Hello and welcome. I am T. Erica with the Feisty News for Women. Today we're doing the Feisty Life Skills Training for Women. This is our second month. We're bringing women into private meetings every month to discuss wisdom, to share love, and to introduce them to women who have overcome situations that they might be trying, that they might go through, or they might be trying to work them, their way, way through. So we have access to so many women with so much wisdom that I wanted you to meet them live. So I brought a few of them in today to talk about radical forms of self-care. What is that, child? It's those things you have to do to make sure you're showing yourself love. Because if you're not showing yourself love and you're putting other people first every single time, you're going to end up living a life of resentment. And these women know firsthand. So I am Tierica. I'm the host and producer of the Feisty News. I am a journalist. I have 17 books and eBooks out right now, loads of podcasts, a prolific digital content creator. But this work I'm doing with the Feisty News is the ultimate in fulfillment for me. And I'm so glad to be here to bring together all of these women and to share this wisdom that I wish I had as I was coming up in my development. But you know, enough about me. We're going to meet the women on the panel today. I'm just going to briefly introduce them and let everybody say hi. And then we're going to get into the Feisty Life interviews. So Anne Marie Zanzel is a graduate of Yale Divinity School. She's an ordained minister, chaplain, bereavement counselor, and coming out coach. She works with cisgender and trans women coming out later in life to the LGBTQIA community. Wow. Welcome, Anne. Say hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tierica, for such a lovely welcome. Awesome. All right, next we have Sarah Kuhn. Sarah Kuhn says, I am a realtor who helps women move forward after their divorce. Oh my gosh, that's going to be interesting. Hey, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> All right, and next we have Angie Barrett. Angie is a registered nurse and advanced trauma-informed yoga instructor, okay, who helps people suffering with mental health struggles change their lives through non-traditional movements and play. How interesting. Hey, Angie. Hey, T. Erica. Thanks for having me here today. I'm so excited. Oh, my goodness. Well, these are definitely a, an eclectic group of women, and I can't wait to hear more about them. So let's just kick off our shoes, grab some wine or some popcorn, and let's get into these stories. We're going to start with Anne Marie. Anne Marie, oh my goodness. I don't even know where to begin with your story. You're a everything. You're a <laughs> minister, a chaplain, a counselor, a coming out coach. Um, I know that you have a transformation story that you want to share with us. So let's talk about before that transformation happened. What was your life like before you made your radical choice for self-care? So I, you know, my life was, I had, um, I would say, check the boxes for everything a woman should do to be considered successful and to have a, a life that is fulfilled. And I was married. I was, um, I have four kids who are the ages between 19 and 20 now. I had a career. I had some wealth. I had everything. I checked all the boxes and there was something missing and I couldn't figure out what it was. And it felt like it was missing my whole life. And so it, it was just this restlessness. Um, I had a restlessness inside of me that I just couldn't figure out what it was, but actually it was something that I was sort of dimly aware of my entire life and that I was gay. And so that's how my life was before I was, relatively happy. Um, but I just had something missing and I couldn't figure it out. 
So when did you end up figuring it out? Were you still married <laughs> while you figured it out? Um, yeah, Noelle, it's actually, a, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So I'm somebody who always sort of knew that I was gay. Um, first time I ever thought about it was when I was like 19 years old, but I was raised like a lot of our women are. And it sounds like, although Sarah and Angie and I do things differently, I do different things, I bet we have a lot of similar threads in our stories. And I was raised in a culture. I was raised, I grew up in the 1980s. Um, and women are acculturated to be a certain way. So I was acculturated to uh, put everyone else's needs before my own. Um, to make sure everybody else was happy before I made myself happy. And I was taught this by my, my family, my friends, my religion, my community, and also about the gay piece, um, even cultural, even laws, you know, I was taught that it wasn't okay to be gay. I grew up conservatively religious and, um, I was just taught that. And so as I got older, I would think about it occasionally now and then, but I knew that I had to marry a man. That was expected of me as a woman. And I was supposed to marry a man who was going to keep me warm and safe and dry, which he did very well, um, and have babies, which I wanted to. I really wanted to have kids. And so I had my four kids, and as I said, the restlessness um, wasn't really present in my 30s because I was so busy raising babies. I didn't have time to think about anything else. But um, in 2006, I read an article in Oprah Winfrey magazine, which talked about the fluidity of women's sexuality. And all of a sudden, I had, I had words and language behind something I experienced. And I realized, although I had started on this straight path, I didn't have to stay on it forever. And so over the next 10 years, I did a lot of exploration, not exploration, but a lot of thinking about it. And um, I, a lot of times people make changes in their life when they have a, what I call a, a catalytic moment. Um, there are people that in the queer community that come out later in life who have catalysts, which are actual persons. They meet a person for the first time. They fall in love. They have feelings that they've never had before. And then there's people like me. And honestly, it was my ordination because I was ordained in 2006. And I think there could be, I think it was that I realized that I needed to live, I was, I had, that had been a 10 years of a lot of work for me as I became a minister and a chaplain and did all these things. I've always been a late bloomer, so I went back to divinity school at 42. Um, so after all that stuff was done, I think I finally let my brain think about being gay, really, for the first time. And I knew that I had to f figure out if I was. <laughs> And, and it took me about six months of being in the fetal position, deciding whether if I should leave my marriage or not to go and explore this. And that's what I did and about six months later and um, started the separation with my, pro with my now ex-husband and began to explore whether I was gay or not. <laughs> and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I can imagine. Can you talk about the reaction from your husband and your children? What was that like? Well, I'm, I would, you know, so a lot of times when people come out as gay, um, one of the things people do is they ask about other people. And the thing is that my, this is my story. And so um, my children, so my, my ex-husband and my two, my two older children knew that I was gay already. Um, I had talked about it for like 10 years on and off, so they knew. Um, my, the first person I ever came out to was my 16-year-old daughter, then 16-year-old daughter, when I read an article in Oprah, the article in Oprah Magazine, and I said to her at that point, hey, you know, so it never happens to dad and me. Don't be surprised if I end up with a woman. And she said, okay, mom, and because I'd raised her that way, so she didn't even think twice about that. Um, my husband knew in 2010, he was my best friend at the time. Um, we had a very good friendship right, based on raising our two children, to, our four children together. Uh, of course, he said the first time around, he said, you're not gay. <laughs> 
And I said, okay, because there was a piece of me that didn't want to be because I liked a lot of parts of my life. Uh, the next time was in 2014 when I told a marriage therapist in marriage therapy that I thought I might be gay and she dismissed it. The therapeutic world is pretty bad with the later in life community. Um, and it was actually someone who was gay, by the way. Um, and then in uh, 2016, when I told him again, he said, oh, thank God. <laughs> Which I think it had more to do with, uh, like a lot of men, um, they don't want to be blamed for the end of a marriage. And I see Sarah ha shaking her head. And so it, it, he could put our, the problems of our marriage, which there were a lot, firmly on my gay shoulders. <laughs> and it was, it's not my fault. It's, you know, she's gay. Uh, so, and the boys didn't know. So my younger two didn't know. And um, it was a surprise. They didn't take it very seriously because I don't think at the time they realized where it was headed. They were like, okay, you know, but they just didn't know where it was going to be headed. You did a courageous thing. You uprooted your entire existence. Everything you had built up until that point was centered around this relationship, this family unit, this lifestyle, the, the main ideal of perfection that we're all striving for because that's what society teaches us. Yet you were willing to walk away, to shake all of that off to live your truth, why is it more important to live your truth than it is to, to revel in the ideal fantasy of perfection that we're all striving for? Because something was missing in my life. And what was missing in my life, for me, now for other women, it may be other things. Mine was my sexuality. I was missing an emotional connection with another human being. And the only way my emotional needs can be met is in relationship with a woman. Now, you know, straight women, their emotional needs can be met, can be met by men, but mine never could. And, you know, now in reflection and it's been a while, um, there's so many signs along the way that I was gay. I just couldn't, you know, at the, when I was growing up and all that stuff like that, it was just so wrong to be gay that I, I just, it didn't, it like, like, you know how sometimes ideas float through your mind and then we just sort of dismiss them. That's what happened to me a lot of the times. And that's happens to the women I work with. Um, I knew I had, you know, you had mentioned I was a hospice chaplain and I was with, with I was a hospice chaplain for seven years. And I saw a lot of people having regret at the end of their lives. You know, n nobody, re people don't regret, you know, trying something and making a mistake. People regret not trying anything, not, tr you know, not trying something. Um, I always say that being gay was a huge gift to me because my marriage was always just okay. I mean, we had a great friendship built around our children. It was just okay. And being gay was the key that gave me the strength to leave my marriage. I, until I admitted that I was gay to myself, I didn't, and I always say when I acknowledged my queerness, <laughs> when I finally acknowledged I was gay, then that was when I had the strength to leave my marriage, which had always been, eh, <laughs> you know, we love our kids, but eh, between the two of us. So basically what you're saying is <clears throat> acknowledging and accepting the truth about who you are and how you wanted to live, even though it was scary, it became your strength. And what I want to point out to women in regards to your story is, can you share the major difference between living the perceived life of perfection and where you are right now living your truth? What does that feel like for you so that women will know they got to do it? So it's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, there's no restlessness inside. You know, my wife and I, we don't have a perfect marriage. We fight. We have, but I don't have this restlessness 
inside of me anymore that that I need to find something and I need to, you know, discover something. Like a lot of the women I work with have so much education, <laughs> doctors, lawyers, psychologists, all kinds of things. And it, they have so much education because they keep searching. And what I think is, I think I would tell any woman, whether, you know, my, 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 as you said, my queerness is my greatest strength, but I also know so many of my friends that are straight and have been in marriages for a long time and they're very unhappy. And it is, if, if we don't listen to our inner voice and if we don't get connected to who we are as human beings, and this is floating around in the Brene Brown circles these days, if we do not get connected to who we are as human beings, then we are unable to connect with other people in a real way. And that's what changed, you know? I can now connect with people in, in a very, very real way. And also not always feel like I don't belong because I always felt like I slightly didn't belong. I had tons of friends, tons of acquaintances, but now I know I have a community that I belong and that I'm a part of. And I'm a subset within the queer community of the later. I mean, I belong to the larger queer community, but I'm also in the subset of people who've come out later in life and have lived a straight life. And I just want to be very clear. The choice isn't, wasn't whether I was gay. The choice was what I was going to do with my life. That's the choice. It's not that I'm gay. I was always gay. <laughs> the choice is how I'm going to live my life with it. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Anne Marie. Anne Marie just shared with her, shared with us that her radical choice for self care was to take action in the knowledge that she was gay versus living in a situation that was perceived to be perfect, but it wasn't perfect for her. And what she gained was not only clarity, but a boldness and a fulfillment and a end to the restless restlessness that she felt. She was always still searching for something and something was missing. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That was such a powerful, powerful story. And I hope that women who are watching this will um, gain the courage to, you know, make their own radical choice. Thank you. Thank you, T. Erica. Thank you so much for, you got it. And I really appreciate it. A lot of times yeah. I do interviews and people don't understand, but I really appreciate what you said and how you summed it up very good so thank you <laughs> yes all right so tell everybody who's watching at this point how they can find you on social media if they want to continue the conversation or get some of this good coaching you got <laughs> sure so you can find me at my name amoryzanzel.com i have a website for people who are coming out later in life filled with resources i have a podcast called coming out and beyond lgbtqia plus stories you can find that on youtube but also wherever you download your podcasts um and you can follow me on instagram facebook linkedin and twitter though i'm minor on twitter for Amory zanzel coaching that's what I'm, you know, I'm sort of, you know how it is. I'm sort of all over the place. With you, this and you should be, and you should be. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, Anna. also too, let me mention one more thing. Okay. Um, I, I have a couple of secret Facebook groups for people who are coming out later in life. And um, a lot of times when you're new, you don't know where to start. And um, these communities are very intentional communities for people. And you can join the Facebook group. Just reach out to me on Facebook and share a little bit of my a little bit of your story with me and you can all of a sudden have a community of 1200 women that get it. So ah. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you me. again. And I appreciate you. And um, I look forward to watching your, you grow. And this is a very important movement that you have because um, everybody doesn't figure everything out at 21. So having guidance and support at a later age for our life transitions is so important. So thank you for leading that movement. Appreciate Thank it. You. Now we're going to move on. We're going to talk to Sarah Coon, get all up in her business because Sarah Coon is like a real estate agent. She's a realtor. She's supposed to be showing houses, being personable, being excited and getting us ready for the next chapter in our lives and the new space, new energy. But she kind of fell into this whole new coaching thing by an accident, but I'm not going to share a story. I'm going to let her do it. Sarah, welcome to the Feisty Life Skills Training for Women. I'm so excited to have you here. 
tell me a little bit about what your life was like before you um, made your radical choice. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I am so beyond excited to be here and I love what you are doing. So um, a little bit of backstory for me is I grew up in a very poor, very poor home. Um, both of my parents were addicts. My father was a heroin overdose who had died when I was 12. And my mother essentially drank herself to death um, and died when I was 15. I was adopted and obviously very depressed up until, I don't know, all throughout college. Um, and growing up during that time, when you have parents like that, at one point, my father he had um, attempted a meth lab and it exploded and we were literally left homeless in um, the little town that we were in. And when you're in a little town like that, word spreads fast. And so my teachers never gave me the time of day. Um, my friends all judged me. It wasn't until later in life that I found out that a lot of them were told they weren't able to be friends with me because of the type of parents that I had. And so um, it, there was this you fit inside of a box. Everybody compartmentalizes everybody else. Society has this really great way, I say that with sarcasm, of, okay, this is the type of person you are, or this is the type of parents that you have. We're going to fit you in this box. You can't really get any better than this because of the type of upbringing you have. So I wasn't supposed to go to college. I was supposed to be another addict of some sort, an alcoholic, um, but I ended up going to college. I ended up being a little bit of an alcoholic during college um, and realized very quickly I was just going to turn into my mother. So I found a man who I thought, okay, this is as good as it's going to get. He's a fabulous human being, very grateful for him, absolutely still one of my best friends today. Um, but I wasn't in love with him like you know, he, he never gave me that feeling, but I was under the impression that you take the first thing that you get, you take the thing that it may not be perfect, but in my mind, I had been pressurized for all of my upbringing that I was not going to be good enough, no matter what. And so therefore you just take what you get. And so I took what I got. I, I found a man, he was the exact opposite of what my upbringing was like he had parents that were wealthy my parents were not he could provide me all the things that i had always wanted to have so i settled and we got married we were married for i think about 12 years we had two we have two beautiful children um and i essentially was able to go on a solo trip to india one year um I, I was, I, it was my 35th birthday. This is what I did for my, I wanted to do holy in India for, for since college. So I went and it was that separation from him that I don't know, something on the inside of me clicked and I realized how incredibly unhappy I had been. I had been living in a depressive state for my entire marriage, doing everything, like Anne said, the way everybody told me I need to do it. You need to get married, you need to have babies, you need to buy a house, you need to go to college. Um, I went to college and never even got to use it. There's this independence in me that I've always yearned to use. And I was a stay-at-home mom, I was bored, I was depressed and I, came home from India and I dove even deeper into this depression and realized very quickly that I was very unhappy in my marriage. And so I asked for a divorce and it um, was the hardest, best thing I have ever done for myself. And I did it for me. Of course, you're going through your mind, you have children. What happens if I get a divorce? What's going to happen to my children? How am I going to hurt my husband? What about him? Because as women, we're constantly worried about other people, not about ourselves. And I, I just couldn't live the lie anymore. I realized that living this lie, I was not only hurting myself, I'm lying to my children. What am I teaching my daughter? How am I going to break this cycle for her? I can't expect her. I would never want her to live like this ever. And so, um, so I asked for a divorce and it was, I decided to start a career from scratch. 
Um, I didn't ask him for a penny. Everybody thinks that I was like this gold digger because that's what women do, right? When they get a divorce, they just want to suck all the money from the men. No, I didn't take a single penny. I did everything on my own. Um, I became a real estate agent and somehow found talking about divorce and helping coaching women and um, helping them find a, a new beginning. So that's kind of the story up until now. <laughs> wow. So you were living a story. Y'all get to live the storybook life? Dang, at least you got to try it, you know. But what I'm noticing is that even the women who are attaining the storybook life is still not enough. So maybe the storybook isn't what we should be looking for. Um, I know that now you're helping other women to manage, you know, the process of their divorce and, and find their later, um, their next, their next place in life. What was that like for you? Like, how did you learn to self-identify after you've been identifying as a wife and a mother for nearly two decades? Um, again, I think similar to Anne, I think I had always known I'm a strong, independent female. I'm like Madonna, you know, I was listening to her today. She is such, she is such a strong, independent woman and uh, I'm mad respect for her. I, I just don't think I was taught that I need a man to do something. And I just internally, I just thought to myself, I don't need anybody. It's not. I'm not trying to say like, I don't need anybody. I'm just saying I can do this just as well on my own. So I think there was this flame always inside of me that just wanted to do it. And now I, there's one question I ask myself when I do anything and, and it's not even a question. It's my mantra. If it's not a whole yes, it's a no. And so as again, as women, we're constantly saying yes to everybody because we feel like if we say no, we're going to hurt their feelings. They're not going to like us, you know, whatever. Um, if it's not a whole yes for me, I say no. It's as simple as that. And that's what I teach every other woman. That's the first thing I say to any woman. If we're look looking at houses and they're like, you know, I'll think about this one. I'm, don't think about it. Is it a yes? Well, I don't. Then it's a no. It's that simple. So I, I, I don't know. I talk about the divorce and it, it found me. And now I just, I actively work towards finding the space that feels good to me. Everybody has this authenticity to them and we're taught to suppress it. And now there's like an enlightenment period that's happening. We don't have to suppress it. We are still, we are fully capable of being happy without feeling like we have to make everybody else happy. Um, if that makes sense. I don't know if that really makes sense, but um, our authenticity is what, may, is what we're here for. And if we suppress that, we are not doing the world any services whatsoever. We are actually doing the world a disservice. We are put here on this earth to share our energy, the one thing that we are good at. And I feel like I have found the one thing that I am good at is inspiring women to do their one thing that they are good at. And if that's through, and if my channel is real estate, fine, I'll, I'll use it. That's what I'll, that's, I'll take it. Um, it, it seems like a, a weird little path to go on, but um, it's a beautiful path. And as I follow it, the flowers just get bigger. And the sun just gets brighter. And I just couldn't be more thankful to be on it. Wow. So I'm just hearing here that you did the thing that most women are afraid of. Most women are afraid to leave any kind of relationship because they believe they're going to lose their lifestyle. They believe they're going to lose their connections and uproot themselves, but mostly their lifestyle. They're like, I don't know if I could do this on my own. So can you tell us a little bit more about being able to create a career from scratch that you're actually sustaining yourself with tell the women that it is possible to do that <laughs> I do every single day um I have actually created a whole program to help women you know see this we set up a budget we set up goals um they're called smart goals they're they're achievable um goals that you set for yourself a lot of people do the 
the new year's resolution kind of thing, right? Let's set a lofty goal. I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year. The thing is, is 50 pounds sounds like a lot, but if you can break that down to one pound a week, to drinking, you know, two liters of water a day, you've now made that really big goal much smaller. So simply by doing something, taking a really big thing and putting it into smaller bites makes anything fully achievable. Also, through neuroplasticity and um, I'm going to get all woo-woo here, manifestation, um, I seeing is believing, speaking it is believing, all of these things, you will actually see what it is that you want happen. So um, I think Kim Kardashian said a couple weeks in, a, ago, and everybody was, you know, giving her a hard time for it. But women, like women just get out there and do the work. You're not working and that you're complaining about not having what you want because you're not working something to that effect. Um, you have to do the work, whatever it is, you'll have to do the work. It's not going to be easy, but nothing that's worth anything is easy to come by. So you do the work, it, it's going to be done. And so it's as simple as that. I, it's really it's just that simple. <laughs> and I know it sounds like a lot of work, but um, it's fully achievable. Um, break it down into bite-sized pieces and it's yours, all yours, whatever you want. Ta-da! And there we have it. I am so excited that we got to hear from, um, from Sarah about her divorce and her transition and the number one thing I learned from you is that there you can create your own life after a divorce and you can, it could be a lifestyle that sustains you and fulfills you. And Sarah kind of tripped into her, um, her, her new purpose after she created a new career. And now instead of being that little girl that everybody said wasn't going to be anything because her parents were drug addicts, she's an inspiration to hundreds, if not thousands of women. Can you imagine going, what's that like, Sarah? Tell me how you feel when you look in the mirror, knowing that these people from your childhood were telling you you weren't going to be nothing, yet your DMs is on blast. You're creating a career. You looking good, girl. And you, <laughs> you all that now. Tell me how it feels now to know that you overstepped every prediction that they had for you. It feels, uh, well, first I'm going to say, before I say how incredible it feels, this is what happens. If you were to see me three years ago, I was probably 60 pounds overweight and very, very sad. It, you would be looking at a completely different person right now. But when I say, if it's not a whole yes, it's a no, um, and you start saying no to the things that do not feel good to you. And you start saying yes to the things that do genuinely, truly resonate with your authentic self. And again, I know how woo woo it sounds, but you start brightening up. The pounds start dropping off of you. The, that feeling of excitement and actually wanting to get out of bed every single morning, that spark, it's, it just comes back. It's just the thing that you've been looking for is all, all of a sudden there, you just got to, you just, if it's the divorce, if it's whatever it is, you just have to do the thing that scares the shit out of you and move away from it. And once you do that, I think, Anne probably that's the reason why it may have taken her for so long because she was afraid and it's fear that holds us back. And it's once we can actually be like, you know what, F you, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to do the thing I'm afraid of then you get to be in my position. I'm not perfect. I'm still working through stuff. We all are, but I feel freaking amazing right now when those women come into my DMs and they tell me their story and I get to be the one to help them through it and walk them through it. It's, it's the most joyous thing I could possibly ask for. Mm -hmm. You're on mute. There you go. <laughs> and that's how we do it here on The Feisty. We find women who are living amazing lives based on the choices that they had to make for themselves and women who are excited about life now, women who are not afraid to share their wisdom to bring the next woman up with them. And I'm so glad to have you. Sarah, how can we find you if we want to connect with you on social media? 
Um, while you typically, everybody finds me on Instagram, um, miss.sarah.i.am. Miss Sarah, I am with dots in between because somebody had taken my name before. So, <laughs> um, but you can also find me on Facebook, um, but Instagram is the main spot. So find me in my DMs there. I will happily respond typically with a voice message because texting just gets too much. <laughs> All right. Thank you again, Sarah, for sharing your radical form of self-care, which is to choose yourself, you know, versus being mildly satisfied by life. And I love that you decided to take the, the hard road, like, okay, I'm going to do this. And I don't know how, but it's feasible. So I'm glad you came to teach women that for tonight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. All right. Get it. We moving on. We getting it. Now we're going to talk to Angie Barrett. And like I said before, Angie Barrett, she's a registered nurse and a trauma-informed yoga instructor. They're just making up careers these days. I think that we all need to just decide, <laughs> this who I want to be, what should I call it, and then just roll with it. I think that that is perfection in action. If you can't find your name on the list, make your name up, and then decide that this is the new path that you're going to live. So Angie, um, first, you know, before I even get into your story, what is a trauma-informed yoga and what, what what is that about yeah I get asked that a lot that's a very common question um trauma-informed yoga is actually a separate certification that teaches yoga instructors how to teach yoga based on people's nervous systems how to create space for different people's experiences when they come to a yoga class so for example, for women who have been sexually assaulted, I'm a sexual assault survivor, going into certain poses is very triggering for me. And so trauma-informed yoga teaches you to start thinking of things like that and then to provide space or options or um, space for curiosity, exploration to decide, no, that doesn't feel good. I'm not doing that. And that's okay. Or, oh yeah, I think I can do that, but that's a little uncomfortable. How do I shift into it to make it a little more comfortable? Okay. All right. That makes bling. It makes perfect <laughs> sense. Now I get it. It's trauma informed understanding that people, some people come with trauma and they're trying to be a part of what you're doing, but please be aware. I, you know, that's so, I tried to do a self-defense boxing class, but I just thought anybody could teach it, but that is not true. You oh. have to have people who are sensitive and who understand the women are coming in have certain traumas that they're working through and I had to abandon that idea for the moment because I got to make sure the person is right so thank you for reaffirming yes that was that's so important so let's talk about your story your radical form of self-care what did you have to do that yes. to make sure you 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 showed yourself some love. Yours is a very interesting story. Share it with us, please. What was your life like before you made that decision? Yeah, so I have been a registered nurse for almost 20 years. I have worked in high acuity settings, emergency departments, and ICUs are my specialty. So definitely um, very traumatizing in and of itself. I was married. I had a very abusive marriage. I was married for almost 10 years. And luckily I did not have children. Uh, that is definitely something that was a conscious choice. Although we had much pressure to have children. Uh, I just knew that it wasn't right. I knew that I was not bringing kids into the world, being married to him. So I finally got a divorce and I've struggled my whole life. I went into nursing feeling like I needed to earn a place in this world. I felt like I didn't belong. I needed to actually um, earn a place to be alive. And I might get a little emotional as I start talking about this, just FYI. Um, so as I got divorced, I thought that that was, that was it. That was going to help my healing. And I did a ton of therapy and I was doing much better. And then in 2017, I was with a partner who started cheating on me and I found out through Facebook. That was how my partner announced to me that they were now with someone else. And that betrayal by my partner opened up memories of being abused as a child. Up until that point, I had no memories of my child abuse and it 
I had always felt like I said, like I needed to earn a place in this world. I had what I call um, a black hole of pain, something that I knew that was really wrong inside of me, but I just could never quite figure out what it was. As soon as I got too close to it, it would shut down. And so um, as in, like I said, in 2017, I found out my partner was cheating on me through Facebook and that unlocked memories of actually being molested and abused as a child. And so I had this double whammy of, <laughs> of emotional um, heaviness that was happening at the same time. But one of those things is enough to put someone into overwhelm. And I was struggling with both. And I started consuming alcohol very heavily. And I realized that um, a nurse showing up to work hungover is not safe. I was started worrying that I was going to hurt someone else and or myself. And so I made the choice. I was actively suicidal. I wanted to be dead. I did not want to actually have to go through what I was going through. So I made the decision to check myself into a, an inpatient psychiatric hospital. I knew that I needed help. I was not safe by myself. And so I found a, a unit that specializes in PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder and checked myself in. And I will admit that uh, it, it, I lived um, on the East Coast at the time and it happened to be in Washington, DC. And so I drove down to DC. And the first day that I was there, I went to check in and the nurse said to me, well, you're not suicidal enough, so we're going to send you home. And I, my brother had come with me, so I didn't have to do it by myself. So I had to go home. It was a weekend. And then Monday came and the woman who was in charge of the unit called me and said, oh no, get down here. You need to be here right now. So I had to drive myself back down to Washington, D.C. by myself to go check myself in to an inpatient psychiatric hospital. Um, it was a lockdown unit and um, I was on suicidal watch for 24 hours. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was admitting that I was at that point where I needed um, I needed that level of help because I wasn't, I wasn't safe. And, um, it was, I stayed for a month and it was the hardest thing that I've ever done. It was therapy multiple times a day. It was really starting to look at the deep, dark black hole of pain that I had. And after a month I felt well enough and, and the counselors felt like I was safe enough to be able to go home and have been on an intensive journey healing from years, years of extensive child abuse. And so my radical self-care was checking myself into an inpatient hospital. My goodness, you went into and you did and you, what? Okay, so you went from caring for vulnerable people and, and people with health issues to being a patient yes you know? what was what what was it like being on the other side of that you know did you learn anything from from being a you know a person being cared for I, yeah, I did. I learned how hard it is actually being a patient. <laughs> I had a lot of shame. I didn't realize how much shame and how much judgment I did carry for people who had mental health struggles because I had such a negative belief about myself and what that meant about myself having to go in and ask for help. Um, and I also learned how important it is to ask for help how incredibly challenging, but how important it is to ask for help. I had wonderful therapists, I had wonderful counselors. And I also learned that part of that is, well, I kind of knew this working as a nurse, there is such a big component. And this seems to be a theme throughout all of us that are talking today, that this inner resilience, this inner strength that we have to have, we have to really be able to find to tap into. And, um, I had to dig really deep for mine. And I, I didn't think that it was that hard because I've been able to handle, I've handled major traumas. I've done all these amazing things. And yet asking for help and working on myself was, was the hardest thing I've ever done. Can you say that after making this hard decision to do the thing that's not socially acceptable, number one, <laughs> admit weakness, you know, admit you need help, 
and to do the thing that society shuns the most, which is to kind of diagnose or kind of label yourself as crazy. That is ridiculously tough to do. But can you say that after doing that, you feel stronger, better about yourself? How do you feel about yourself after doing the thing we ain't supposed to be doing? We ain't supposed to be letting people know that we need help like that. We're not supposed to let people know that we're weak or we're struggling. It was the best decision I've ever made. It truly was the best decision I've ever made. I found a sense of internal strength and it actually has led me to my purpose of helping folks heal now. So it has given me a springboard to be able to use my story, my experiences, to be able to talk about that shame, to be able to talk about um, the feelings that I experienced, my feelings of worthlessness, my feelings that I have no value, all these things that I grew up, these negative beliefs that I have has enabled me to actually now be able to talk about it, to be able to share with others so that hopefully I can destigmatize mental health. Not everybody who struggles with mental health and has to go inpatient is crazy or is what you perceive, you know, what we see on TV or is, you know, even what I saw working in emergency departments. There are many of us who are, and I'm going to put this in quotes, normal, but who are highly functioning. I had held a job for multiple years. I was a productive member of society and yet I still needed that level of help. And so it opened up a channel for me to be able to share those experiences to help others heal on their own journey. Best decision I ever made. Wow. Did they put you in a straight jacket? No, but I was worried. I was terrified that they were going to. So it, I was watching my mouth of what I said for the first, um, they, they have everybody on suicide watch for the first 24 hours. You can't leave the unit. You can't go get food. They have to send food up to you. And I was worried that if I said the wrong thing, I was going to get, you know, medicated against my will or, you know, whatever it was, but no, no, it was, it was actually, they were so kind. They were very, very open and receptive to my needs. Um, it was, I have never felt that supported and that cared for. And that's what I needed at the time. All right. So tell me this, how do you bounce back from that? So that's like, Ooh, I'm sure your worldview changed, not only of yourself, but of the world after going through that experience. Were you able to come back, still be a professional, still build up a life for yourself? Because to me and to a lot of people, I'm sure that it feels that entering into that situation is an ending. It actually was a beginning for me. It helped me realize that I didn't want to be a nurse anymore, that being a nurse was actually more traumatizing for me. It was feeding into this cycle of having to live on the edge and the adrenaline. And so like most people do, I decided to go back to graduate school because when you don't know what you're going to do, you go back to graduate school. I was trying, uh, or I was attempting to become a nurse practitioner and I just didn't, it wasn't for me. And so I took a sabbatical from graduate school and the yoga studio that I practiced at, I've done yoga for years. The yoga studio was offering a yoga teacher training. So I decided to take that and I loved it. I loved being able to help people now proactively do things to change their health or to shift their mindset, to be in their bodies. And as I've gone along, I've now gotten trauma informed. Um, I'm a trauma informed yoga instructor and I've also made up my own title. So like you were talking about, I am what I call myself an intuitive movement coach. I teach people how to move based on what their nervous system is telling them. So when they feel anxious, move big. When you're feeling depressed, move smaller, but find ways of moving, doing lots of play. So I've created now this whole um, healing modality that wasn't there, that wasn't accessible for me as I was going through my journey. And um, so I not only have bounced back, I found what my true calling is, my higher passion is than being a nurse. Wow. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. I appreciate you, Angie, for sharing that truth. Um, Angie, if we want to find you on social media, we want to follow up with you. How can we do that? Yes. Um, Angie Barrett movement is my handle for pretty much everything. I spell my last name B E R R E T T. So I spell it a little weirdly. 
Um, my website is angiebarrettmovement.com. Um, it has links to all my social medias, but all my social medias are Angie Barrett Movement. So um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I just joined Twitter. So follow me because I have one follower on Twitter. Uh, but Angie Barrett Movement is how you can find me. <laughs> okay. Thank you again, Angie, for sharing your story. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Does anyone have any questions that are in the audience or anyone wants to make a comment? Please let me know. I just wanted to say one more thing um, because it's the, it's the common thing amongst all of us. And if anybody out there is questioning, you know, what do I do or how do I proceed? Or if you are, if, if it is a life or death situation, um, you know, suicide is a thought. We have all had to do the hard thing, the hardest thing all of us in order to get where we are today. Um, we've had to put ourselves into therapy. We've had to ask for divorces. We've had to start life all over again. Mm -hmm. And if we, any of all, all of us sitting here, if we did not do that, we would not have found our true authentic voices and we would not be able to be here helping other people to do the same thing. So. If you need any sign at all, let this be it right here that um, you are not alone and we are all doing the hard thing and we are all struggling. So you've got this and you've got humans right here to help walk you through it if you have any questions or need any help. Thank you so much uh, to Erica for letting us be here. Thank you. And I would love to piggyback on what Sarah said and Angela said is that. Um, it seems like there's a common thread that I think most women experience as they're growing up. We all experience some sort of trauma. You know, we all came from some sort of chaotic homes. And so a lot of times we have to like work through that stuff before we can get to whatever the next path of our journey is. But also there is a shared humanity among women and we don't talk about this enough. All of us here sitting around this table, metaphorical table, we have so many more things in common than we don't have in common. And so we need to talk about things like this that are really difficult to talk about because I've struggled with mental health stuff. You know, I grew up in a chaotic home. I get it. I understand all those things. And so just remember, we this is the common human experience. And so if we acknowledge our common humanity, we can not only have radical forms of self-care, but we can also have really radical self-compassion. You know, um, if, if I'm a big, huge Kristen Neff fan. She teaches a lot of stuff about self-compassion and, and that and, and health self self-compassion is self-care. So it's okay mm. to love yourself. It's okay to, to treat yourself really, really well, because when we do that, we can treat each other so much better. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. Yes. Angie, do you have anything you want to add? I just wanted to say there's hope. There, there's hope. How um, There's so many different modalities and listening to all of all of your stories here on this panel tonight gives me hope in humanity, gives me hope in, um, in life and in the healing possibility and the power of women using their voices. And Tierica, thank you for giving us this platform to be able to share that. And not only that, but for sharing your story as well of learning to fail. That's a hard lesson to learn. And so, I guess what I want to leave is there's hope. There's there's lots of avenues for hope. And this um, feisty news network is one of those ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for the big ups, for the congratulations, and for supporting and for being here, ladies. I really appreciate you. Can we smile again in case anybody out there wants to take our picture? Cheers. <laughs>
All right. Now that we got that, um, I just want to thank everybody who joined, people who came through um, to, to leave the comments. I appreciate you stopping by. Make sure you come back again. We're having these um, every single month on the first Saturday of the month. Um, and next, the next topic will be um, parents and caregivers of people with autism. We're going to talk to people who are um, dealing with um, this particular um, um tricky circumstance in their lives and we're going to make sure that they have support so if that's you make sure you show up next saturday by subscribing to the feistynews.com so you'll receive that link thank you so much ladies we're going to end the program here this has been radical forms of self-care you had the absolute best women on the panel today i'm so excited that you joined us and make sure everybody follow them on social media to keep in touch all right guys i'll talk to you soon Bye, 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 thank you. Bye. Welcome to the fighting. Welcome to the fighting. Welcome to the fighting. News for women.